So, uh, yeah, yeah, right, so welcome to the last lecture of the school. Uh, so, uh, uh, this, this lecture is going to be uh, uh, more about the sort of forefront of this field, and uh, uh, correspondingly, it's going to be uh, more speculative, and uh, things here are going to be slightly more controversial. So, uh, uh, take it all with that spirit. Um, uh, so, so uh, uh, yeah, so I want to describe some generalizations of my Rana zero modes. Before I do, let me just uh, 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 recap what I had last time. Okay, so, so if you remember, uh, actually during the discussion, we discussed why um, uh, my Rana, the, the braiding rules of my Rana zero modes are not uh, universal. Okay, and the argument was that if you just have four my Rana zero modes, Okay, gamma one, gamma three, gamma two, a, 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 gamma, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, gamma four. Okay, and you you consider all the possible braiding operations you can do on this one qubit. Okay, you you fix the total fermion parity, that leaves two states. That's your your uh, Hilbert space. That's your qubit, and uh, it turned out that if you uh, represent this uh, two-level system as a spin half, and you look at the block sphere. Okay, all the all the braiding operations are actually nothing but uh, rotations uh, by pi over two around the x, y, or or z directions. Okay, so so uh, uh, you basically, if you start from the north pole, the the, the uh, set of points that you can reach is just uh, these uh, these six points. Okay, so definitely you don't cover the entire sphere. Um, okay, and uh, I. I argue that this this actually generalizes to a system of n qubits. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll just tell you how the what what uh, what terms you need to actually show this. It's not difficult, but uh, uh, it's actually uh, enough to show that uh, uh, if you take n of these qubits uh, uh, and you consider the the set of all the possible braiding operations, they all preserve. A, a, some set of operators, which are the, the so-called Pauli group. Okay, so the Pauli group a, on on one qubit. That's just uh, plus or minus i, which is a two, a, a, a two by two uh, identity matrix plus or minus i times a unity a plus or minus a sigma x plus or minus i times sigma x plus or minus sigma y and i plus sigma y, and the same for sigma z. Uh, okay, so this is the so-called uh, uh, Pauli group, and uh, if you consider uh, n qubits, you just uh, uh, um, consider basically this, the same operators acting on all the qubits and all their products. Okay, that's the uh, n qubit Pauli group, and uh, 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 what you can show is that you consider all the braiding operations of n qubits. Okay, so braiding. A of n qubits for these uh, Majorana zero modes, uh, you get that they actually uh, a, they a, a, a actually conserve this this group of uh, this this Pauli group, meaning that they they map every element of the Pauli group to another element. Okay, so so uh, that already tells you that you you can't get very far. Okay, the 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 a, the states you can reach are a, are are uh, Quite limited. Okay, so I'll, I'll need that uh, later on. Okay, a, a, a generalization of this uh, result. So, so uh, uh, that makes us think uh, how to go beyond Majorana zero modes. Okay, is there something richer? And uh, the fact that we got non-abelian zero modes already in one dimension is very encouraging. So that, that's so a question that often comes up in discussions of this is: Can we? Design some sort of uh, one-dimensional interacting system uh, uh, that would give us some uh, topological degeneracy and also some non-abelian anion, which is beyond Majorana. Okay, and uh, uh, there are arguments that say that that's impossible. I've not seen that in the form of a theorem, but uh, it's it's believed that that's that's not possible in principle. Okay, and uh, uh, let me just uh, uh, show you how you can. Understand that, okay, and, and uh, say some of the words that go along with it, and 
be happy to discuss it further with anybody who's, who, anybody who's uh, interested. But it's, it's useful for, for this purpose to uh, understand uh, in a slightly more general setting, what is this topological phase that occurs in the Majorana chain? Okay, so, so uh, the way I've presented it, it was really tied to non-interacting fermions. I showed that the zero mode is there uh, through uh, uh, um, considerations of the, of the BDG equation. There's actually something much more uh, general from which you can also understand why the uh, Majorana zero mode is actually robust in the presence of interactions. Okay, it has nothing to do with single particle physics. It's much more general. Okay, and to, to see this, let me uh, go back to the uh, Kitaev chain. Okay, so, so I, I wrote it last time. Uh, so there's a, there's a one-dimensional lattice with a hopping term. Uh, there's a uh, pairing, nearest neighbor pairing term. And a uh, chemical potential. Okay, and as you, as you know, you can actually map this problem into a problem of spins, of spin halves, by the Jordan-Wigner transformation. So that's in, uh, instructive. Let me, let me do that. Okay, so, so what I do is uh, let's consider a system with open boundary conditions with n spins, uh, and uh, uh, let's write the fermion operator as a, a product, the so-called uh, Jordan-Wigner string, Okay, over k less than j, uh, sigma minus uh, of j, uh, sorry, sigma uh, z of k times sigma minus of j. Okay, so so uh, our uh, uh, two states of a site would be uh, uh, the two the two eigenstates of sigma z, which uh, represents the two states of the fermions, empty uh, uh, or occupied. And a, a psi removes a, a one fermion, so it's, a, it's a sigma minus. But to take care of the uh, anti-commutation relations, you have to you have to uh, attach the string, and then a sigma j dagger sigma j. The number of the fermions is just sigma j plus sigma a j minus. So that's equal to one plus sigma z over two. Okay, so uh, uh, you can map the uh, Hamiltonian into the language of these spins. Uh, okay, so that's a straightforward uh, computation. I've done it here. Okay, so, so the uh, result is uh, a, it, there's a, a nice looking spin Hamiltonian. Uh, okay, so there's T plus delta uh, over two times sigma x j sigma x j plus one. Uh, and then there's a plus T minus delta over to a sigma y sigma y j j plus one and a, then there's a minus mu sum over j a sigma z okay so so uh a, a, we got some uh, some a, a, a spin hamiltonian which has a, a short range interactions okay that's that's uh that's very general actually okay so the the a Jordan Wigner tr tr uh, transformation is non-local because it has these strings, but uh, since we uh, the uh, fermionic Hamiltonian only contains uh, terms that have even powers of fermions, these strings always cancel. Okay, so the spin Hamiltonian is always going to be a, a short range. Okay, and uh, notice that the spin Hamiltonian uh, has some symmetries, and that's also not an accident. Okay, so. Uh, Basically, the fermion parity conservation symmetry is reflected in, this, in the symmetry of the, of the spin Hamiltonian. Okay, so, so uh, a, the, what we called fermion parity, okay, which is e to the i pi times the sum of j psi dagger j psi j. Okay, that's a, that, that's a, that's a symmetry of the a, a fermionic Hamiltonian, and it's a fundamental symmetry. Okay, that's a symmetry... Uh, that would be there for any Hamiltonian of this type. It's in, 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 in a sense, it's impossible to break that symmetry, at least without, uh, without making the system uh, incoherent. Okay, so, so uh, that's, just, uh, a, a, that's just the product over sigma z, a, a sigma z up, to a, up to a constant. 
Okay, so, so uh, what this uh, symmetry does uh, is basically it takes sigma x uh, into minus sigma x and sigma y into minus sigma y. Okay, so, so if you change some parameters in this uh, a, a spin Hamiltonian, what you expect is that there, there could be several distinct phases that are characterized by a, either this uh, symmetry of flipping the sign of sigma x and sigma y being broken or unbroken. Okay, so, so uh, that should give us some a, a, a distinct phases. And since the a, a fermion parity symmetry cannot really be broken, these phases are really robust. They're sort of robust to anything. Okay, but uh, on, on, the, on the other hand, there should be nothing else. We, we don't expect any other symmetries, uh, uh, any other phases to appear if we don't uh, 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 impose some extra symmetries. Okay, and uh, uh, one can find, for instance, the, the phase diagram of this model. Okay, it's, uh, this model is exactly solvable. You can see that it's mapped to, to uh, free fermions in particular. Okay, and I, I drew it here. So this is for some fixed chemical potential. Uh, this is as a function of uh, T and delta. Okay, and uh, this is what the phase diagram looks like. This is mu over 2. This is minus mu over 2. Okay, there's a, there's a whole line, uh, which is uh, over here. Uh, Okay, this, this whole line uh, is, is gapless. Okay, so that's uh, basically uh, a, a dxy model. A, a, and uh, this, this region here is all disordered. Okay, and then uh, these, these uh, four quarters are ordered in various ways. This is sigma x non-zero. This is sigma y, non-zero. OK, this is a spontaneously a broken symmetry phase in this language, in the language of the spins. A, and this is, uh, again, sigma x, non-zero. And this is sigma y, non-zero. OK, so, so uh, a, if you go back to the fermions, you can sort of identify what the a, a broken symmetry states are. They're just the a topological phase of the fermions. Okay, and, and uh, there are various ways to understand that. If you take a system with, a, 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 for instance, a system with open boundary conditions, a, you expect to have two ground states, which are either a, a, the order parameter is pointing in the plus or minus direction for the spins. And similarly, for the fermions, you expect two ground states, which are a, a total fermion parity, even or odd. Okay, and the uh, disordered phase would not have this uh, a degeneracy. A, so you can basically track down through this uh, jordan wigner uh, transformation and see that these are, these are uh, indeed the phases. The, f the fact that we got here dis a, a distinction between, between uh, a sig a, an, an x-ordered phase and a y-ordered phase is, an, is sort of an artifact of this model. This model has an extra symmetry, which is time reversal symmetry. Okay, and I can break that and these phases would be adiabatically connected. Okay, so, so the general reasoning is that if you take a, a generic model of spins a, in, uh, in one dimension, and you could, you could invent any model that you want, you can complicate, it, a, 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 complicate this model by extra flavors or extra a, interactions. If you don't implement any symmetries, you expect every phase to be adiabatically connected to a, any other phase. Okay, in one dimension, that's a consequence of the fact that you don't really have intrinsic topological order in one dimension. But if you have some symmetries, you can get distinct phases. You can get so the, the so-called symmetry protected phases in, uh, in one dimension. So one, one example of that was mentioned, it's the AKLT phase a, 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 that was a, mentioned by uh, a, a Nicola in his, in his uh, a lectures. Or if you have some Z2 symmetry like this one, that symmetry can be spontaneously broken or not. Okay, if, if the model is actually a model of fermions, that's, that you, you can't break that symmetry explicitly, and then you get two phases, but, but no more. Okay, so, so uh, uh, that's, that's the, yes. Yes. 
Um, right. So, so the the um, um, this uh, the uh, uh, the argument is that if you don't impose any any extra symmetries, you'll uh, you'll you'll get nothing if you start from bosons, and you'll get two phases if you start from from fermions because the fermions always have this Z two symmetry. Okay. If you if you uh, um, introduce some extra symmetry, some Z three symmetry. Then you would get extra phases, extra possible distinct phases. Okay, that's the way I understand it. Um, okay, now now this is con somewhat controversial. People, this keeps coming up. Um, uh, the the best argument I know to show this is based on uh, representing the one-dimensional ground state wave function as a matrix product state, and it's it's based on the assumption that it's a good approximation. Okay. Uh, uh, um, uh, the, the ground state wave function of a gapped system in, uh, in 1D can be represented well by a matrix product state. But uh, it, it, this is not a theorem. Okay, don't take this level of a theorem. I've not seen any counterexample that I was convinced by. Okay, but uh, if you find one, one uh, think about it well and then uh, uh, let me know. Okay, so. Um, Right. So, so uh, um, the the crucial point here is that the fermions have this fundamental symmetry, okay, the, which is the Z two fermion parity symmetry, that you can't really break at the level of the Hamiltonian, and uh, therefore they they always have the, intrinsically these two these two distinct phases. Uh, okay. So now I'm going to discuss another situation where there's a higher symmetry, a Zn symmetry, which is also kind of intrinsic. But that's going to come from the fact that our system is not going to be really one-dimensional. Okay, so that's that's the way sort of out of this no-go a uh, quote-unquote theorem. Okay, so uh, the idea uh, that I'm going to discuss basically for the rest of this lecture uh, would be to co to consider a system which uh, uh, is uh, effectively one-dimensional. But it's the edge of some higher, higher dimensional system. Okay, so so uh, uh, there's uh, some some 2D system which has edge states. Okay, so this would be our uh, our uh, uh, if you like this this in, in practice this would be uh, some quantum hole droplet. It has edge states, and these edge states uh, are like a one dimensional system, but this one dimensional system has special properties. It knows that it's coming from the boundary of some, some higher, higher dimensional thing. Okay, so the uh, example I'll discuss, uh, uh, I'll think about uh, what I'll call a fractional topological insulator here. Okay, so I'll uh, uh, explain what, what that means. So uh, we've just discussed uh, a topological insulators in the in the last in the last lecture. Okay, so so uh, this is just a fractional generalization of that. So uh, think about two layers. Okay, of uh, a of a fractional quantum Hall state, basically a Laughlin state. This layer has a filling fraction of one over m. Okay, m is odd, and a uh, it has spin up. And this one has a filling fraction of minus one over m. Okay, you can uh, imagine that it, it sees effectively an opposite magnetic field, uh, or it's uh, it sees the same magnetic field but it's made out of holes, not electrons. Okay, and and uh, such that the uh, the hole connectivity, for instance, in, is uh, a, a opposite in sign, and also the the spin is is uh, reversed. Okay, so so so. Uh, it's a it's a 2D phase. It, it turns out that this is actually a stable phase. It also has a, a, a gapless edge states as long as uh, a time reversal is is uh, preserved. Okay, you can see that this is this thing is uh, time reversal invariant. If these are really uh, time reverse partners of each other. Okay, so this is just for for m equals one. This would be the usual topological insulator for for uh, m. A greater than one, three, five, and so forth. This is a so-called fractional topological insulator. Uh, this was discussed by uh, by several people. I think among the first were uh, uh, Levin and Stern around 2009. 
Okay, they basically argued that this is a stable phase in the sense that uh, if you look at the edge states, there's a chiral edge state of the, of the new equals 1 over m, uh, um, and uh, there's a chiral edge state of the minus 1 over m with the, with the opposite direction, and they have a, a opposite spins. Uh, what they showed is basically that as long as you have time versus symmetry and uh, particle number conservation, these edge states cannot be gapped out. Okay, so, so uh, it was just argued for you that that's true for m equals 1. It's not so obvious that it's true also for other fractions, but nevertheless, for this case, it is true. By the way, uh, interestingly, it's not true for any uh, fractional quantum Hall state uh, attached to its time versus uh, pa partner. There's some criterion in this paper that discusses when are the edge states uh, stable and when, when, are, when are they not. Yeah. Right, so, so, uh, um, right, so, so, uh, yeah, so, so, uh, generally they, they, they do become gapped. The condition is basically time versus symmetry and, uh, particle conservation. Okay, in this case, uh, for a, for a, a Laughlin state, that's true. Okay, they, they do, do remain stable. Uh, for more general fractional quantum Hall states, there's a criterion in this paper which is goes, Something like if you take the, um, okay, I, I won't try to, uh, uh, I mean, you, 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 you basically look at the um, fundamental, uh, ch the charge of the fundamental quasi-particle times two, uh, you ask whether that's mod four, okay. I'll, I'll, <laughs> um, there's some simple and nice criterion to when, when this is true and when, when this isn't. Okay, now, now, um, uh, right, so so it's a it's a gapped phase. Um, it has these counterpropagating edge states, uh, and uh, we said that they're gapless as long as you have transversal and particle number conservation. That means that you can gap it out if you break either transversal or particle number conservation. Okay, so there there are two distinct ways to gap it out, and the way you can uh, uh, imagine physically gapping them out uh, is the following. So you just attach on the boundary, you attach here a, a superconductor that breaks the uh, particle number conservation effectively on the boundary. Okay, so there are Cooper pairs that can tunnel in and out just as in the wire that we've discussed before. Okay, and uh, there's another way to gap, gap it out, which is basically to introduce a ferromagnet here Okay, so this is an in-plane polarized ferromagnet. I've defined some spin axis here according to up and down. Uh, so if this ferromagnet is polarized in the plane, it basically has a term that, uh, uh, that flips the spin from up to down. Uh, and on this edge, that means backscattering. So that, would, that could actually gap this, this edge state out. Okay, so, so uh, uh, this kind of setup was actually considered for the case M equals 1 by uh, Charlie Kane and Yang Fu. And uh, maybe not so surprisingly, what they found is that if you gap some of the edge out by a superconductor and a, a, another part of the edge out by a, a ferromagnet, a, the, the, the whole boundary is gapped except at the interfaces between these two regions, and there you get the Majorana zero mode. Okay, so one way you can uh, understand this result so sort of intuitively is to say, well, um, think about the, the dispersion of the edge state in that case that was just uh, described to you in the last lecture. Okay, you have a right moving mode. This is K uh, uh, of the edge uh, and this is, uh, this is energy. You have a right moving mode with a spin up and a left moving mode with a spin down. So if your uh, Fermi level is, uh, is somewhere here, okay, at the Fermi level, this, this looks like a, a spectrum of a spinless system just like the wire that we had before. Okay, so it's essentially like a 1D wire with only one right mover and one left mover. If you gap that out with a superconductor, you would get actually a topological superconductor, just of the kind that we had. Now, this, uh, the way to terminate the superconductor is to open a non-superconducting gap, and that's exactly what the ferromagnet does. Okay, so, so what I'm gonna consider is the fractional generalization of that on the edge of a fractional topological insulator. Okay, and, and um, eh. 
So uh, un unfortunately, we don't quite have fractional topological insulators in the lab. Uh, uh, the way we do have sort of integer topological insulators. Uh, however, the uh, uh, fractional topological insulator, you should not think about as literally here. You should really take it as uh, just as a pictorial representation. The same thing can uh, be achieved actually with, say, with a bilayer of quantum Hall states, of fractional quantum Hall states. Uh, the system doesn't actually have to have time versal symmetry. The time versal symmetry here is not, doesn't actually play any role. I actually break it explicitly by introducing the ferromagnet. Okay, so I can really imagine this as just a bilayer of, uh, say, graphene. Okay, two layers of, of uh, graphene. One of them doped with electrons and one of them doped with holes. This is something that you can actually do by applying a perpendicular electric field, for instance. Okay, and then they both see the same magnetic field. There's no time versal symmetry, but nevertheless, the edge states would be uh, moving in the opposite ways on the two, on the two layers. Okay, so then I have all the ingredients I need to get this. I have to attach a superconductor from the side. Okay, so here's my sort of setup. Here's my superconductor. Okay, so there's some region on the edge where I let Cooper pairs tunnel into, the, into, the, into bo both edges, okay, to the right and left mover. And there's another region on the edge where I just let them backscatter into one another. Okay, both of these processes would open gaps, but there are different kinds of gaps. If you like, they, uh, they stabilize different phases on the edge, and uh, a, these phases are topologically distinct, and at the interface between them, I'll get some new kind of zero mode. Okay, so this would be our system. A, a, so how do I actually analyze this uh, the system? Okay, that's basically what I'll do for the less for the best part of the rest of this lecture. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to be imagining this kind of setup. Let me sort of uh, open this thing up and flatten it on the board. Okay, so this is one side of my uh, of my boundary, and this is the other side. This is a nu equals one over m. This is nu equals minus one over m. Okay, and here are my edge states. Uh, okay, moving in the in uh, opposite directions. So uh, overall, my system looks like a non-chiral uh, wire, essentially. Okay, if I if I count my degrees of freedom, that's what it's look it it, uh, it looks like. And I'm gonna introduce this uh, kind of array. Okay, I I want several zero modes, so I'm gonna introduce a in a, a, uh, a alternating array of uh, regions where I couple my system to a superconductor and regions where I couple the system to a ferromagnet. Okay, and this is gonna alternate like this. This is another ferromagnet and, and so forth. Okay, so, so uh, I'm gonna use uh, a bosonization to describe the edge a, 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 I'm going to write down an effective low energy theory that describes this edge state and then perturb it by, by these couplings to the ferromagnet and the, and the superconductor. This uh, edge th theory was already introduced. A, okay, so I'm going to introduce two fields a, that I'll call phi r and phi l. These are the chiral fields a, of, the, of the right mover a, a, and, the, and the left mover. And uh, a, the system is described by a, a Hamiltonian, okay, so uh, a, a H naught, which is the free part of the Hamiltonian without, a, without coupling to the ferromagnets and to the, to the superconductors. That's just a, a, a Langer liquid Hamiltonian. So it's written like this, some velocity V, M divided by four pi a integral dx, a dx phi r, a squared plus dx phi l squared. These are just this, the sum of the two uh, chiral Hamiltonians for, for right and left movers. Okay, the fact that they're moving right or left is encoded in their, in their uh, uh, commutation relations. Now, uh, let me just mention, uh, unfortunately, there are many conventions in bosonization. Okay, the number of conventions is 
approximately equal to the number of people working in the, in the field. Okay, and, and a, a more unfortunately, I'm used to a different set of conventions than the one that Karlian introduced, so I'll, I'll, I'll just relate them. Okay, uh, uh, Karlian, I believe, worked with a field uh, called a uh, Varfi. Okay, and this is uh, really this was a chiral field for uh, for a single edge, and uh, the field that I call phi r is uh, is this var phi divided by square root of m, if I got it right. Okay, of Karlian. Okay, so uh, um, correspondingly, if you take the uh, the uh, correlator within H naught within this Hamiltonian uh, of the phi r's phi r of z times phi r of w, okay, that's equal to minus 1 over m times log of z minus w. Okay, and, and uh, uh, then w we, we have a whole dictionary uh, that relates these operators, phi r and phi l, to physical observables uh, uh, of the system on the edge. Okay, so, so uh, there's a whole recipe how to write the different operators. Before I do, let me just write the commutation relations that are going to be important. Okay, so uh, I'm using a Hamiltonian formulation here, so I'm going to uh, write the, uh, uh, the canonical commutation relations. So phi r of x uh, with uh, phi uh, r uh, of x prime. Okay, in my, in my conventions, this, this is equal to i pi uh, over m times sine of x prime minus x. Okay, this is for the right movers and for the left movers, uh, there's, a, there's a minus here. Okay, so uh, that's one set of, of uh, a commutation relations. There's also a commutation relation between the right and left movers that basically would take care of the fact that uh, fermionic operators on different edges uh, uh, anti-commute. Okay, this is also something that there are various conventions uh, to introduce. This is the one I'm using. Okay, so this is equal uh, to pi over m. And uh, I can write now the uh, uh, the physical operators of the edge, as was was shown, in terms of these fields phi r and phi l. Okay, so uh, uh, for instance, I can write uh, the operator that that uh, uh, annihilates an electron on the right or left moving edges. Okay, that's going to be a vertex operator. So that's um, a in this language, it's e to the plus or minus for right and left uh, times uh, i m phi right or left at some position x. Okay, so this is the just uh, a, a, an electron op a, a operator. It has a charge of one, one times e, and there's there are also quasi particle operators. Okay, these are the the, the Laughlin quasi particles, chi r and chi l they should uh, a, a remove a charge of E over M. Okay, so there's just plus or minus I times phi R or L. Okay, and then we have the, uh, the, the a, a charge operator rho. Okay, th this is the charge density on the edge. Uh, that's equal to one over two pi a, a dx phi R or L. Um, there's also for for this problem. There's also uh, a, a a density that I'll call the spin density, okay, R or L. So this is the um, um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I jumped ahead. Yeah, there's 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 going to be charge and, and spin. So charge is going to be the sum of these two. What I'll call spin is going to be the difference of these two. Okay, so, so uh, if you think about this as a fractional topological insulator, the difference is actually the spin density, which is also the current for, for this problem. Okay, this is out of place. Okay, so, so um, uh, now I can, I can write the full Hamiltonian. Okay, so, so this was my H naught. This was my, uh, a, the, the free part of Hamiltonian. And uh, what I want to write is the, the terms that describe the couplings to the superconductor and to the ferromagnet.
Okay, so they're written uh, as follows. Uh, so uh, uh, H is going to be equal to H naught minus a integral dx. A, there's some function, gs of x, that's basically the uh, strength of the coupling to the superconductor. So this is a function of x because the superconductor doesn't cover the entire edge. Okay, so this function is just, uh, if you like, it's uh, a equal to some g naught a, a on the regions of, of the edge that have the superconductor on them and zero everything else, a, 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 a everywhere else. Okay, and uh, a, what I'd like to write here is uh, a basically a term that creates a pair, Cooper pair on the edge. Okay, and this term I can bosonize uh, using this uh, dictionary. Okay, so uh, so this term is just equal to uh, a to uh, a cosine a, a m times phi r minus phi l. Okay, and uh, similarly, there's a, a term that describes the coupling to the fur magnet. So there's a function gf, which is which is uh, basically a, a constant where the where the fur magnet is and and zero everywhere else. And here, this is just backscattering. Okay, so psi r dagger psi l. This flips a spin. Here, flipping a spin means also a going from right to left mover. Blast remission conjugate. Okay, and this, if you write it out, uh, this is just uh, the cosine of m phi r uh, plus phi l. Okay, and um, for 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 uh, uh, analyzing this problem, it's uh, convenient to actually define new fields uh, 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 from these uh, phi phi r and phi l, which are called phi with no label in theta. Okay, these are just the uh, sum and uh, a difference of uh, phi r and phi l. Okay, so phi r a minus phi l. And this is uh, phi r plus phi l. Okay, I'll be using actually the phi and theta rather than the phi r and phi l. And uh, in, in, uh, in terms of these new fields, uh, my Hamiltonian is now a h naught a minus integral dx a g superconductor times cosine of two uh, m times phi. Okay, plus g f. This is a function of x. A cosine of the so-called dual field. Okay, a two m times theta. Okay, these two uh, fields uh, 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 don't commute. Okay, you can find their commutation relations by using the commutation relations of the phi r and phi l. Uh, they satisfy the following. Phi x uh, with theta of x prime. Uh, that's equal to i pi over m times a uh, step function of x prime minus x. Okay, so so this is a one if x prime is bigger than x and zero otherwise. A, that means that the uh, phi and theta don't commute if the theta is to the right of phi and commute otherwise. Okay, and a, a from the relations of the phi r and phi l to the charge, you can also work out that the total charge, which is rho r plus rho l, that's equal to one over pi dx theta. And a, the spin density which is the difference of the charge right and left movers, or the current, okay, that's the same, that's a, a one over pi dx of the dual field phi. Okay, in some loose sense, the, these fields are like momentum and position, more precisely, the, it's the derivative of the theta field, which is like the uh, conjugate momentum of phi. Okay, so, so uh, now I have a Hamiltonian, a, a, and I have to solve it. Okay, so a, locally, in in the region where G S is non-zero and G F is zero, that just looks like some sine Gordon problem, and vice versa. Okay, in the regions where the G F is uh, is non-zero and G S is zero, it looks like a dual sine Gordon problem. 
Okay, the, the uh, difficulty of solving this comes from the edge. Okay, okay so I, I won't actually solve it. I will make some statements about, about the solution. So basically what I want to argue is the following. So uh, first of all, there's always a possibility that these kind of coupling terms are irrelevant in an RG sense, and then the edge would just remain gapless. That, that possibility is uh, a, uninteresting for me. I'm going to assume that either these uh, GS and GF are large enough, or I can also uh, change a latitude parameter a, in H0 that, that I can do by a forward scattering interaction between the two edges. Okay, that would, a, a, a tuning that far enough, would make these cosine terms relevant in the respective regions. Okay, so I assume that the cosine terms actually open a gap everywhere in the bulk of these regions. Okay, and I'm assuming that these regions are big compared to some correlation length, such that these boundaries are far apart. So within each one of the superconducting and ferromagnetic regions, everything's gapped out. Okay, now, a uh, if it's gapped out, if I'm in the massive phase, if you like, of, the, of these two uh, sine Gordon dual sine Gordon problems, then uh, I can say, well, the, uh, the field phi in the superconducting regions is basically pinned to one of the minima of the respective cosine term. Uh, okay, so, so uh, uh, the minima occur uh, at values of phi. Uh, okay, so, so this is... Uh, basically just uh, um, a phi j is pinned to one of the minima of the cosine, which is some a, a, a integer nj times pi over m. Okay, so, so uh, a, a I basically break, if you like, spontaneously the symmetry of, uh, of shifting from one minimum of the cosine to another. And uh, similarly, theta l in the uh, a corresponding a, uh, a, a ferromagnetic regions is just NL, a, which is an integer a times pi over M. Okay, let me just fix my notations. A, so I'm gonna call the thetas, a, the, what I mean by theta L, for instance, here. Okay, so this is, um, a, this is called a, some theta j a plus one. Okay, there's a phi. This is a superconductor. There's a phi j here. This is phi j plus two. Okay, the j labels the corresponding a, a domain on the edge. A, there's a theta in every ferromagnetic region. So, so basically, take the the phi's a, a, a phi j is defined for j even. And theta j plus one is de uh, defined for j plus one odd, and so forth. Okay, so one may think that I can label my different ground states, uh, basically according to these integers, to these different integers. Okay, but, uh, now the different integers are independent from each other, because uh, in the middle between uh, uh, two of the superconducting regions, uh, I have this big ferromagnetic region. So uh, essentially, there's no coupling between the phi in this region and the phi in that region. Okay, so, so uh, uh, the first thing I want to do is to count the, 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 uh, the number of ground states that I get. So this would kind of suggest that the, the, if I have total n domains on my, uh, on my edge, okay, this means n over 2 superconductors and n over 2 ferromagnets. Imagine... Uh, a, a disk geometry, and I have overall n domains around this boundary, then a, basically you can think about this phi and theta as an angular variable. Basically, it's a phase. It's periodic with a period 2 pi. Okay, so I basically have 2m distinct minima here and 2m distinct minima there. So I basically have just um, 2m uh, to the power n ground states. That turns out to be not quite right. Okay, the, the reason it's not right is uh, because of the fact that these, these variables, phi and theta, don't commute with each other. Okay, so, so uh, effectively, the, the, uh, 
the order parameter for the different phases is e to the i fine e, 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 and uh, e, e, e to the i theta. And from the commutation relation that I wrote there, okay, you can see that a, a, if you exchange these two vertex operators, you get a phase, a, okay, which is minus i pi a over m times theta a of uh, l and j a times the same thing with the opposite order. Okay, so so you can sort of characterize the the state of the superconducting domains by the expectation value of the corresponding field phi j. Okay, you can say this is equal to some amplitude times e to the i a pi over m times n j. So if you like, you can choose the basis in which all of the n j's are well defined. Okay, but then if you try to measure uh, the expectation value of e to the i theta, that's going to be zero. Okay, because the theta is just fluctuating, if you like, between all the different uh, uh, equivalent minima. This is basically uh, 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 the same as the fact that you can't have a well-defined momentum and well-defined uh, position to a particle at the same time. Okay, so, so this means that the, uh, 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 the actual number of distinct ground states uh, is only a, uh, okay, so it's proportional to a uh, 2m to the power n over 2 and not n. Okay, because I can choose to, uh, to fix all the, all the phi j's, but then the theta, theta, j, theta l's are, are uh, 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 ill-defined or vice versa. Okay, so, so this is square root of 2m to the power of n, to the power of the number of domains, or to the power of the number of interfaces between domains. Okay, so, so every one of these interfaces uh, is going to have some sort of zero mode, uh, and each zero mode is going to contribute a factor of square root of 2m to the ground state degeneracy. Okay, so this uh, uh, suggests that uh, there is a zero mode uh, which has a quantum dimension of square root of 2m. Okay, and uh, square root of 2m is square root of 2 times square root of m. The square root of 2, you might suspect, is just a uh, Majorana zero mode. And the square root of m is something else. Okay, it's something uh, distinct from Majorana. Okay, you, you also notice that if you put here m equals 1, you recover just the uh, expected ground state degeneracy for Majorana zero modes, which is what you should get for this problem. Okay, so, so uh, 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 that's the picture. Okay, and I'm going to uh, try to give you some intuition for it. Okay, so I, I, I guess I'll try to give intuition for it, then break, then uh, continue. Uh, okay, so, so uh, uh, there's a very physical way to understand what these different uh, degenerate ground states are in a very similar way that we, we uh, understood them for the Marana wire. Okay, so, so uh, uh, you can think about it this way. Uh, uh, here's my array of ferromagnets and superconductors. Uh, so this is a ferromagnet, this is a superconductor, ferromagnet, so forth. Okay, and uh, I, I can ask what's the charge which is in this uh, superconducting island on the boundary. Okay, this is a superconductor which is coupled to the uh, uh, fractional topological insulator boundary. This is essentially like a, 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 an isolated su um, superconducting island because it's flanked from bo both sides by these ferromagnets which are essentially insulators. Okay, so I, I want to ask what's the charge here. Okay, so, so uh, uh, this is Q. Uh, this region is labeled by 2. This region is 1. Okay, and uh, this is, I, I pick some point here, x1, and here's some other point, 
a x3. Okay, the point in the middle here is called x2. So a, the a total charge operator, Q2, I can use the a relation between the charge density and the uh, a, a bosonized fields. That's just the, a, the integral dx a, going from, say, x1 to x3. Okay, I can pick some arbitrary points within the insulating domains because they're not going to co contribute to the charge fluctuations. And this is just 1 over pi times dx theta. Okay, so a, I, I see that, a, that this is just 1 over pi a theta of x3 minus theta of x1. Okay, and a, I've argued that uh, a, a, what happens is that a, since a, both of these ferromagnets are in their gapped phase, the, a, the a corresponding thetas are pinned to values which are a, a integer multiples of pi over m. If you plug that in here, that means that the charge in this uh, superconducting domains is actually a quantized in units of 1 over m. Okay, this little q2 is some some integer. Okay, so it's it's basically like uh, a a little a, a little superconducting island that has quantized charge in units of fractions of one over m. Okay, which which is just a consequence of the fact that it's living on the boundary of uh, a, a a Laughlin state that can can have uh, fractionalized uh, charges in the bulk. Okay, but this this uh, little superconducting island is is coupled to a bulk superconductor, and uh, this can exchange charges with my with my edge, but only in units of Cooper pairs of two. Okay, so that means that this this charge is only well defined mod two. If you like, the only well defined thing is e to the i times pi q two. Okay, and that can take any value. Uh, of this of this form, so this is basically the same operator that we looked at before. That's the fermion parity. In the case of my runners, that could take only two values, plus or minus one. Here, it can take more values. Okay, it can actually take two m distinct values. These are basically my two m states per superconducting domain. Okay, but uh, actually, very similarly, I can define a spin operator that uh, lives in the in the ferromagnetic regions okay the the um, uh, this is the sum of the charges of the right and left movers this is the difference of charges okay so uh, uh, for instance i have the s s3 which is the spin of this uh, super, uh, of this uh, domain so e to the i pi uh, s3 in a very similar way, okay. The problem is just dual, so so you can trans you can you can uh, translate everything uh, that I said for charges for these spins. This would be just e to the i phi a uh, four minus phi one, so sorry phi times uh, minus phi two. Okay, it's basically uh, a, a the integral from here to some point x four. In a in a very in a very similar way to the to the charge. This uh, spin, the way I've defined it, is actually only well-defined mod 2. Okay, that's because I've called the spin of a single electron 1. And uh, the ferromagnet can flip spins, but can they, it, can, it can only flip spins in units of electrons. It flips a spin from up from plus 1 to minus 1. So it changes the spin by 2. Okay, so it's really only the fractional part of, this, of the spin, or the spin mod 2, which is well-defined, and that's represented by this operator. And uh, in a very similar way to the fine theta, okay, you can see that if I try to exchange these two operators, if you like, these are like two conserved quantities of my problem. Uh, basically, all the Qs of all the superconductors and all the Ss of all the ferromagnets, because of the fact that I get these isolated islands that can't exchange charge, fractional charge with their environment. Uh, but uh, these two symmetries are actually not uh, commuting with each other. Okay, if you try to exchange uh, the Q operator with the S operator, okay, so e to the i pi S i uh, times e to the i pi Q j, 
Okay, you see that um, if if you take Q i and S j to live in some disjoint uh, regions of space, they commute because uh, you you have theta minus theta in one and phi minus one uh, phi minus phi in the other. So uh, the phases that you get from uh, commuting the phi and theta would would cancel. But if they're entangled like this, okay, for instance, if I take Q2 and S3, uh, Q2 is the difference of the theta at X1 and X3. The, uh, S, uh, um, the S3 is the difference of the, uh, of the phi in X4 and X2. Okay, so, so uh, when, when you get this crossing, they actually won't commute. So this gives you uh, a, a e to the i pi a over m, delta of uh, i and j plus 1. Okay, that is to say, if they're neighbors, it's non-zero, minus delta of i plus 1 a and j. Okay, times the same thing with the opposite order. Pi q j a times e to the i pi s i. Okay, so that that gives a more physical interpretation of these different ground states. You can label the uh, this uh, uh, 2m to the power n over 2 manifold of uh, zero energy states, either by the charges of all the superconducting states, mod 2, okay, and they, they could be fractions now, or by the spins of all the ferromagnetic domains. But you can't define both at once, okay, because th these are non-commuting variables. Okay, so that's basically the, uh, the structure of the low energy manifold. Uh, what I want to discuss next is zero modes. Okay, this, um, I've just counted ground states. I have not said nothing about uh, what physical operators can actually take you from one ground state to the other. And then I want to discuss braiding. Okay, if I get this kind of topological degeneracy, which this is, that's always inviting to think about braiding these things, just the way we thought about braiding Majoranas. And um, uh, this actually gives some new braiding rules. Uh, okay, but let's take a break. All right, so uh, yeah, so next I want to find zero modes. Okay, so so uh, in the case of uh, of m equals one, if this is a, a, a an integer to a topological a insulator, a, a you can consider exactly the same setup, and we saw that you get Majorana zero modes, which are localized at these interfaces. the The bulk of each one of these regions is is gapped. Okay, but you get you get uh, a, a a a bound a zero mode at every a one of the interfaces. So a, physically, what that means is that if you try to inject an electron somewhere in the middle of either the, fer the, the uh, a, a ferromagnetic or the uh, superconducting regions, you'll have to supply some finite energy above the Fermi energy to do that. But if you inject it a, in some region within a correlation length a, 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 a close to some boundary, you'll actually be able to inject this electron a, at, at zero energy. Okay, so, so this is the, the zero mode operator. It's just a, a, uh, a fermion creation operator, essentially. And you can say that locally, the fermion creation a, a, a operator has some overlap with the Majorana zero mode that's sitting at that interface. Okay, what, what's, the, what's the analog for the fractional case? Okay, so what, a, what kind of operator, physical operator, you can act on a, in the region of the, of the interface? Okay, so so uh, what would that be here? So so uh, you have a guess. Okay, so so uh, uh, you can think about the fact that uh, uh, you can you can describe the different ground states essentially, as I've described, in terms of the charges of the superconducting regions, which are quantized in units of of e over m. Okay, these are fractional charges. And uh, the, the zero mode operator is also the operator that it's the physical operator that can be used to flip between one ground state and the other. 
Okay, so, so the natural candidate to do that is just the Laughlin quasi-particle. So, so you can have a process where basically a Laughlin quasi-particle comes from the bulk and uh, gets absorbed in this interface. And that can happen, it turns out, in, in the bulk, the, a Laughlin quasi-particle is, 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 an, is an excitation, it has a gap, it costs some finite energy, but it, it can actually be absorbed into this interface at zero energy cost. Okay, just like an electron, a single electron, which is gapped in a superconductor, but can be absorbed at the Majorana zero mode. So it's basically a sink for Laughlin quasi-particles. Now, uh, of course, this Laughlin quasi-particles must have come from somewhere. If it came from the bulk, in the bulk it costs some finite energy. But uh, in the same way that we can absorb the Laughlin quasi-particle uh, particle at the zero mode, we can also emit it in a different zero mode. Okay, so we can have a process where we create, we, we basically uh, pull out one Laughlin quasi-particle from this interface and then move it to a different interface. This is a physical operator. Okay, it's a, a, it corresponds, if you like, to some tunneling process of Laughlin quasi-particles above the gap. And uh, this operator would actually have a matrix element between different states in the ground state manifold within this 2m to the power n over 2 states. Okay, it's a finite dimensional Hilbert space and there are physical operators acting on it that correspond to tunneling of Laughlin quasi-particles from, from one interface to the other. So, so uh, uh, let me uh, okay, try to argue for this slightly more formally. Okay, so I'll draw the system again. Uh, this is my nu equals uh, 1 over m and this is also nu equals 1 over m. Okay, notice the when I when I draw when I uh, uh, flatten the system like this on the board, both sides actually have the same filling fraction because I've unfolded the system. Okay, I've flipped one of them, and the uh, the edge state is moving to the right here and to the left there. Okay, here's here's a uh, a superconducting domain over here. It's characterized by a value of phi j. There's a ferromagnetic domain here that has a theta j plus 1, and a, another superconductor that has a phi j plus 2, and so forth. Okay, so a, what I want to describe is a process where I bring in a uh, Laughlin quasi-particle, okay, and uh, inject it, for instance, in this interface over here. Okay, so this point is called x naught, and a, a, I know how to write in the uh, field theory that I've written for you before, I know how to write the corresponding operator. Okay, and uh, you see that there are actually two such possible operators. I can bring the Laughlin quasi-particle from this side or from that side. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I actually have two labels for this operator. I'm going to call that chi um, a R or L, or a, what I'm actually going to use is actually a spin. Okay, I, we, I, I describe the system as having also opposite spins to the two sides. So there's going to be a chi up or chi down. A, that's going to have a label of the corresponding interface. Okay, so it's going to be the label of the uh, domain to its left. So th this one has the label of j plus 1. Okay, and this one is supposed to be proportional in the field theory uh, to uh, uh, e to the i phi of x naught and then plus or minus theta of x naught plus or minus corresponds to spin up or spin down. Okay, the two two kinds of processes that are possible. Now, uh, notice also that in the case m equals one, I don't have this uh, distinction between up and down, because then this is just an electron. The uh, uh, electron doesn't actually have to live on the on the uh, topological insulator uh, plane. It can come from anywhere. Okay, it can come from vacuum. Uh, uh, whereas here, these, these quasi-particles are really excitations of the underlying quantum hole fluid. They have to come from the plane. Okay, so, so this is my operator, so if in full glory, but that's not what I'm interested in. I'm, what, what, what I'm interested in is actually the projection if, of this operator onto the low energy subspace, onto the uh, subspace of the a, a zero energy states, okay, which is finite dimensional. So, uh, first of all, how do I see that this is a zero mode, that this doesn't create an excitation? Okay, so first of all, note that if I didn't 
bring this, uh, this quasi-particle here, but I brought it actually somewhere in the middle of some domain, say here, a, this would actually create an excitation of the system, a finite energy excitation. Okay, and the, the way to see that is by, by the fact that the field a, 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 a e to the i theta a, creates a kink in phi of uh, a magnitude of pi over m. Okay, so we, we, we had a cosine of 2m phi here. So phi, the, the um, vacua of this region are described by phi constant and equal to one of the values of the minima of the cosine. If you act with e to the i theta there, okay, the e to the i phi you can basically re re replace by its expectation value, but the, the e to the i theta creates a kink in phi. Okay, if you act with e to the i theta here, a, a, and this kink a, costs some finite energy in the gap phase. Okay, so that's why we have to act with this operator at the interface, where if you like, right at the, at the interface, the kink doesn't cost any energy. Okay, so that's, where it, that's why it has a chance to be a zero mode there. Okay, now, now there, there's, there's a, a clean way to uh, show that this is actually a zero mode. Uh, okay, which is to, uh, uh, what you have to do is basically ex uh, blow up this edge a little bit and uh, describe it like this. Okay, here's my superconductor. Here's my my ferromagnet, and here's the uh, little piece of the edge between them. Okay, so I sort of treat the ferromagnet and the superconductor as boundary condition uh, for this finite segment of gapless edge between them. Okay, the, the, a, a gapless edge is a free field theory. I can solve it using boundary conditions that, that tell me that the field phi is pinned to some value here and the field theta is pinned to some value there. That's an exactly solvable problem. You can solve it and show that uh, there is a zero mode of this form. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, by the way, this, this whole construction is described uh, uh, in, uh, in a paper by, by, uh, um, uh, by Clark, uh, Alicea, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, Stengel, uh, and by our paper, Lindner. Uh, uh, myself, uh, uh, Rafael, and Stern, uh, also 2012. Okay, this uh, nice argument of, con of uh, uh, solving exactly for the zero mode in, in this setup was actually a, a, a in, in, uh, in Jason's paper, we just waved our hands. Okay, so let me wave my hands. So, so um, a, a the way one can argue that this is a zero mode uh, is just to say, well, uh, let's split a little bit the, uh, the operator e to the i phi times e to the i theta into two parts. Okay, so uh, uh, after all, this is quantum field theory. Everything is only defined within a correlation length. So let's, let's act with a, with a field um, e to the i uh, this is a superconductor, so e to the i phi at x naught minus delta x, and uh, with the field e to the i theta at x naught plus delta x, where delta x is some small separation of the order of the correlation length. Okay, and uh, uh, this field has a well-defined expectation value, if you like, in the f in the in the ferromagnetic region. And that field is is uh, well defined in the superconducting region. Okay, so these are actually zero modes. They can actually be th there. Th these two fields are condensed on the two sides. Uh, okay, but uh, notice that uh, as we said before, to characterize the the different states in the zero energy uh, subspace, uh, you actually have to choose a basis either you uh, pin the phi's to their, to their minima and then the, the, the thetas are ill-defined or a, a, a vice versa. So that actually means that the, uh, a, this uh, zero mode would have a non-trivial action on this zero energy subspace. Okay, it, it, um, a, a, this is basically what I'm gonna describe now. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm gonna construct a explicitly these zero modes 
So uh, the, the zero modes are constructed as follows. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, write my, my zero energy Hilbert space. Okay, I'm going to choose the basis uh, uh, where all the thetas, say, are well defined. Okay, so theta L, as we wrote before, is pi over M times NL. Okay, so uh, every state in my Hilbert space is going to be just a sequence of these NLs, okay, N1, uh, N3, and so forth. Remember that there are thetas only on the, uh, on the odd regions, the um, uh, ferromagnetic regions. And then I can act with the, uh, with the operator uh, chi, okay, chi uh, uh, J, um, uh, in this example, let's take the chi j plus 1, exactly, uh, uh, precisely that operator, would spin up or spin down and act on the state nj plus 1, uh, nj plus 3, and so forth. Okay, so, so uh, uh, this operator has two parts. It has the e to the i phi that I imagine acting on the, on the left side, uh, on the, uh, on the uh, uh, neighboring um, this picture is, uh, yeah, sorry, no, I, 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 I want to act with the phi here on the right, on, on the right hand side, on the, on the, a, a, on the neighboring superconducting domain, and with the theta on the, on the left. Okay, so, so, uh, the theta essentially, uh, uh, acts on an eigenstate, because the, uh, the theta variables are well defined in this basis. So, the theta part would just give me a phase which is plus or minus e to the i pi n a, n j plus 1 over m. Okay, and then the phi uh, that acts here uh, 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 is actually non-diagonal on this basis because phi shifts theta. Uh, 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 acting with phi here basically shifts all the thetas to its right. That's because of this non-local commutation relation between phi and theta. Okay, so, so wh what this gives me is the state nj plus 1, and then uh, all the n's to the right of j plus 1 get, sh get shifted by plus 1. Okay, so this would be nj plus 3, nj plus, uh, uh, NJ plus 3 plus 1, nj plus 5 plus 1, and so forth. Okay, and you can check that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the charge of, um, of this uh, superconducting domain is actually the difference of the thetas from the two neighbors. Um, one of these neighbors was shifted by one, the other one wasn't. That means that the charge of the superconducting domain was actually shifted by a unit of one over m, as you expect, because you've deposited a, uh, a, a fractional charge quasi-particle there. Okay, and uh, uh, similarly, you can define also, so, so this is the form of the uh, chi operator on a domain where you have a ferromagnet to the left. There's a similar form for a, uh, a, a quasi-particle here with, a, with the uh, ferromagnet on the right. Okay, there's some sort of even odd effect in this definition. By the way, for m equals 1, these definitions just give you a representation of the Majorana operators on the zero, a, a, a zero energy Hilbert space. Okay, and the interesting thing here is to uh, uh, look at the exchange relation between these, these different zero mode operators. Okay, so if you try to exchange them, because of the fact that they contain these two parts, there's one part that gives you just the phase of the local n, and another part that shifts all the n's on one side, it's kind of a string operator, uh, they actually don't commute, and uh, they satisfy the following relations. Okay, so first of all, if you take each one of these chi's, either with spin up or spin down, okay, and, uh, a, and you raise that to the power of 2m, that's equal to 1, okay, that's, uh, or that's rather that's a uh, unit matrix. This is just a, a generalization of the fact that the Majorana operator squares are 1. And uh, if you take them at, at different positions, they satisfy that a chi j say with spin up times chi k at some a other site. Okay, here I assume that j is less than k a, with any spin sigma. Okay, and you exchange these two, 
this is equal to e to the minus i pi over m um, chi k sigma chi j with spin up. And if you do the same thing with the spin down uh, here, okay, so this is spin down, you'll get the plus here. Okay, so, so uh, once again, if you take m equals 1, these two just anti-commute because these are Majoranas or fermions. And uh, for the general m case, th this is a, the, the so-called parafermionic uh, exchange relations. Okay, this is kind of extends extends the uh, a, a relations for for uh, fermions. Okay, so so uh, this is called parafermionic algebra. Okay, a a, uh, a model of uh, a paraf parafermions on the lattice was actually introduced by Fendley. A uh, also, I think the paper is 2012, and this is nothing but a realization of that model in a, in a concrete physical setup. Yes? Yes. Yes. This, this one. Right. That's an excellent question. Uh, so, so um, um, the, uh, yeah. Uh, the order here is important. That's the key. Okay, I've, I've chosen some gauge. The phi doesn't commute with the thetas, but only on one side. Okay, the phi doesn't commute with theta on its, on its right. So what I can do, if I did it more cleverly, uh, okay, I would choose the superconductor here and the ferromagnet, and the ferromagnet there. Then phi, um, sorry, theta is pinned here, and phi is pinned there. These two variables actually commute. Okay, so I can I can actually I can actually choose a basis if you like in which there's a state in which uh, both of these fields are well defined. In the other case, it's just harder to solve, right? But uh, based on duality, I sort of expect the physical answer to be the same. Right, it's a good question. Right, so a uh, uh, yeah, so this is a model of a uh, the, the zero modes the, the zero mode operators form. A, a, uh, a parafermionic algebra, and now I can start coupling them together. Okay, so so far there was no coupling; everything is at zero energy. But just as in the Majoranas, I can ask what happens if I allow particles to tunnel from one edge to the other. Okay, and uh, uh, these tunneling events would be described in the uh, uh, in the low energy manifold by some uh, operators. Uh, Okay, so, so if you have, for instance, a, a tunneling event from the interface J to J plus 1, there's going to be a Hamiltonian, okay, an effective Hamiltonian acting on this uh, low energy subspace, which is going to be some amplitude times chi with some spin. And now the spin depends on wh whether you allow quasi-particles to tunnel from above or from below or both. Okay, some spin, a J dagger times chi a, a same spin, these two have to be the same because a fractionalized quasi-particle cannot actually pass through vacuum, okay? So a times j plus 1 plus remission conjugate from the a, a explicit form that I've, I, I've given you for these chi's, you can actually find what this operator is and it turns out that it's nothing but t times 2 uh, so it's a hopping from here to here. There's a ferromagnetic region which is enclosed by this hopping, and it's just cosine of pi times the uh, corresponding spin operator, j plus 1. Okay, and similarly, if you let, if you let quasi-particles hop uh, across a superconducting domain, you would get uh, that the uh, corresponding operator is cosine of pi times q, the charge in the uh, corresponding superconducting region. Okay, and these two operators don't commute. If you have a neighboring S and Q, they actually don't commute. So you can sort of consider it a, a lattice Hamiltonian where these, these, uh, these things sort of, uh, you allow hopping from all a, 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 a interfaces to their neighbors. A, this turns out to be nothing but uh, a, a quantum 
a, a Z3 clock model, okay, or Z, Z2M actually, Z, Z2M clock model. Okay, and it has interesting properties, it has a phase transition, um, um, and so forth. Okay, but, but uh, uh, let me actually, in the, in the last few minutes, let me talk about braiding. Okay, so, so uh, uh, I have this uh, 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 zero energy uh, manifold of states, and now I want to define something like braiding. Well, I've already, uh, I already sort of know what to do, because I have this uh, discrete braiding protocol that, uh, that uh, uh, gave braiding of uh, Majorana zero modes. I can try to uh, repeat the same, the same process here. Okay, so, so my setup schematically is the following. Here's my disk of a fractional topological insulator, and there are some uh, alternating domains. Okay, so this is, uh, a, I'll label the uh, interfaces now, one, two, three, four, and so forth. And uh, suppose I want to exchange three and four, these two zero modes. So uh, I, I know what to do. I have to introduce some two auxiliary zero modes, one and two, Okay, and I have some Hamiltonian, which uh, depends on time, and that's going to be of the form um, sum over i and j between 1 and 4. Okay, and there's some coupling constants here, lambda ij, chi i, uh, okay, and here it also has a label sigma. Uh, chi i sigma dagger chi uh, uh, j sigma plus remission conjugate. Okay, so this is now, it, 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 these parameters lambda depend on time. This is a time-dependent Hamiltonian within this uh, a, a, a zero energy manifold. And a, in the same way as for the Majoranas, a, I can try to design some sort of a trajectory in parameter space that would uh, give me, a, would mimic braiding for me in this discrete space. Okay, and so, so uh, a, I won't have time to go into much detail, let me just a sketch a few, a few of the, I mean, just uh, how, how it's done in the result. Okay, it's, it's done in a, a essentially the same way as for the Majorana zero modes. So uh, let me forget about the geometry here, even though it's somewhat important, and just plot these as uh, four points. Actu actually, even better, let me plot them in a way which is uh, suggestive to the way I've dealt with Majoranas. Okay, so I draw them like this, and uh, I start from uh, one and two being coupled. This, is, this was my step number one, and uh, I follow basically the same, the same protocol. Okay, I have to turn on a coupling between one and three, turn one and two off, a turn a on a, a coupling between one and four, turn this one off, and then turn one and two back on. Okay, it's the same sort of three-step process. There are subtleties here, though. Here, the, the way they're ordered is important. Okay, if you, if you recall the um, parafermionic exchange relations, they cared about whether, if you exchange chi i and chi j, it's important, actually, whether, chi, whether i is to the left or to the right of j. Okay, so you have to be a little bit more, more careful here. And moreover, you also have these spin labels, which, uh, which you have to decide what to do with. There's another subtlety, which is that, in fact, in this problem, there are much, much more parameters than in the Majoranas, because uh, the Majorana operators square to one, whereas these operators, uh, uh, only if you take them to the 2m power, they give you one. Okay, so for instance, if I couple one and two, there are many different coupling terms that are possible. Okay, I can write one, say spin up, dagger chi one, up, plus conjugate, but there's actually a distinct operator, which is chi 1 up dagger squared times chi 1 up squared plus conjugate. And all of these are possible. Okay, so uh, if you like, this corresponds to a tunneling of a single Laughlin quasi-particle be be between the two interfaces. This is a coupling of a pair and so forth. And if, if the two interfaces are, say, close in real space, all of these tunneling processes are possible. Okay, but it turns out that this... Uh, this braiding protocol 
um, is very insensitive to a lot of the details of the actual path and parameter space. It's topological, okay, so we kind of anticipate that. There's one caveat, which is that um, it turns out that you need to um, sort of, it doesn't really matter how exactly you write the couplings between a certain, in, in, a, in a sort of a finite range of parameters, as long as you only allow one spin flavor to tunnel, okay? So, so uh, um, in particular, there's one step within this protocol. Uh, you see that it's, it's number, okay, so let me actually draw it like this, two and one. Uh, it's actually number two here, which is coupled to everybody in various stages. And it, it turns out that uh, there's one critical step where number two is, has to be coupled to four. So then it, it jumps over one of the interfaces and then it really becomes important whether it's spin up or spin down. For a first neighbor, it doesn't matter. For a second neighbor, it does matter. Okay, and the important thing that is that you only allow one of the spin flavors here to hop and not the other. If you allow both, it turns out that you destroy here the ground state degeneracy. You, you lift the ground state degeneracy, uh, even if you don't couple three to anything. Okay, so that's different from my runners. Uh, up to that one caveat, okay, everything sort of works the same, and uh, one can do this computation uh, of the uh, adiabatic evolution operator. Okay, so there's a matrix that describes the, the braiding. Uh, in this case, it's the matrix U34. Okay, it's the braiding of three and four, and one can actually find it explicitly. Uh, you can write it like this. So it depends only, so this is a, a, a superconducting region. Um, uh, this is called, the, the, the corresponding charge here is called Q, um, I guess Q4. Okay, so, so uh, the uh, a braiding matrix of three and four only depends on Q4. Okay, and it's just written like this. It's uh, e to the i pi m a over two times Q4 squared. So it's just a phase, it's diagonal in this basis where Q4 is diagonal, okay? And Q4 is just uh, some integer over m, so I can write this as e to the i pi a m over two times Q4 uh, divided by m squared. Okay, and uh, you, you can see that in the case of my runners again, if you take m equals one, th th this Q4 is just zero or one, and you get a, a, a relative phase of pi over, pi over 2 between the two states of the two parity states that was the result for my runners and uh, and now this you you get a you get a generalized phase okay you get pi over 2m times q4 squared so so this is the spectrum of eigenvalues that you get for this braiding now the braiding matrix of course looks diagonal so you can ask what's non abelian about this well it's diagonal in the basis of q4 but if you can also exchange two and three, uh, you would get the same expression with the corresponding spin operator of the ferromagnetic domain. Okay, so this would be S3. So you'll get basically the same matrix, but uh, uh, that uh, depends on the eigenvalues of S3. And S3 and Q4 don't commute. Okay, so this is a non-commuting uh, um, set of matrices. Uh, okay, so, so uh, I'll just make couple of comments and conclude. Uh, okay, so, so uh, uh, we started by, by uh, uh, asking, can we get richer, something richer than Majorana's? So we, 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 we can, this is, this is richer, uh, in the sense that you, you get different phases. Uh, in fact, you can show that uh, these matrices um, form a representation of the braid group, just as the, as the braiding of Majorana does, and this uh, uh, representation um, is actually uh, reducible, okay, this, this matrix in the basis of the eigenvalues of Q4, this matrix is, 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 uh, is 2M by 2M. Okay, you can show that uh, you can write this matrix as a tensor product of a 2 by 2 matrix and an M by M matrix. The 2 by 2 is just braiding of Majorana's. Okay, so there's a real sense in which this uh, quantum dimension of square root of 2M uh, is really just square root of two, which is my runners. They live in their own subspace. And then tensor uh, the square root of M, which is the parafermion or the fractionalized my runner. And it has its own braiding rule. Okay, to, to see this, just, just notice that uh, 
uh, you have this number Q4, um, and uh, you can always write that as 2 uh, times uh, some integer uh, plus m. m is an odd number, okay, times some, uh, some other integer, okay, where n2 is 0 or 1, and n1 is between 0 and m minus 1. Okay, if you just substitute that in there, you'll see that it decomposes into these two parts. Uh, uh, you can ask, well, we, we know that the Majorana part is non-universal non for topological quantum computing. Uh, we can ask about the square root of m part. Okay, that turns out about to be also non-universal non for uh, quantum computing. Uh, it looks kind of inviting to think, well, for the Majoranas, we were only missing one phase gate. And if we could get that, we can, if we could enrich the Majoranas by only that one phase gate, we could, we, th th that would be uh, universal. So here we get all sorts of phases, which are not pi over, pi over 2. Uh, but it turns out that you can't entangle these two subspaces of the Majoranas and the generalized Majoranas uh, in, a topological, uh, in a topologically protected way. I mean, if you could entangle them, then you get a, a phase gate, which is not pi over 2, and you're done. That's not quite the case. Okay, but um, uh, more generally, I mean, you can ask, well, wh where, well, wh where, where, where did this extra degeneracy and where, where does the extra non-abelian statistics come from? And uh, there's kind of a more general framework to think about uh, um, this, this phenomenon. Okay, the, the, uh, the way to view these, uh, these, these zero modes is as follows. So suppose I just have a fractional quantum hole droplet, just a single fractional quantum hole droplet with filling fraction 1 over m. Okay, and now I, I, uh, what I've done effectively is I cut sort of a little slit here. And on the slit, I have my two edge states. And the slit is finite. It just terminates somewhere. Okay, and then I, I couple this region on the edge to my superconductor. And uh, here are two ends of the superconductor. Okay, so I can... I can uh, a, Imagine that this is equivalent to, to uh, the setup I've been considering because there this edge continued, but I just let electrons in this region tunnel from one edge to the other. This was the ferromagnet. Okay, if I let a, 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 um, electrons tunnel and uh, let the uh, tunneling amplitude to be strong enough, this would just essentially heal this boundary. This would just recover the uh, fractional quantum hole droplet in this region. Okay, so what I have is just a little slit which I cut and then healed back with a superconductor. Okay, in some sense, this is like introducing a branch cut in the quantum hole droplet. And, and this defect is the termination point of this branch cut. Okay, and, and what, what this branch cut does is basically it allows me to turn a quasi-particle into a quasi-hole. Okay, on, on this region, pairs of quasi-particles from the two opposite sides are condensed. So uh, this was the, the Q, basically, that could, could take any value uh, in, in, in units of 1 over m. So I can have a process where I bring a quasi-particle from here. Uh, OK, this is an E over m. I, uh, I create the quasi-particle quasi-hole here. This is E over m and minus E over m. OK, and these two join the condensate, and I just emit a minus E over m. Okay, so essentially, if I coarse grain this picture, and a quasi-particle became a quasi-hole. So, so this branch cut is basically a point where one type of quasi-particles of the underlying two-dimensional theory becomes another one. Okay, it's like a, it's like a twisted boundary condition, if you like. So here, quasi-particles remain quasi-particles, and here they turn into quasi-holes. Uh, that's kind of the general framework, as, as it's understood now, how to... Uh, um, classify this, this phenomenon. So uh, these kind of defects in an underlying a uh, topologically ordered phase uh, uh, generally carry zero modes. They increase the, the, uh, um, the uh, dimension of the, of the ground state um, manifold, and they carry some non-abelian statistics. Okay, so, so the, uh, the, the, the defects uh, in abelian topologically ordered phase are now pretty much classified. In uh, non-abelian phases, it's pretty much an open problem. Um, uh, in abelian phases, they're actually never universal. Okay, in uh, non-abelian phases, it's uh, it's unclear. Um, 
Right, so uh, um, with that, let me thank you for your attention. And let's also thank the organizers of this very nice school. All right, any questions? Um, I'm not, not sure I, under, I understood the question. So, so uh, if you... Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, so, so you're referring to the fact that I, I write this kind of discrete model and that has an explicit Z, Z to M symmetry. Or so, so um, um, right, and, and th so that's true. And, and what's the what's the second part of the question? So, so why why does that? Um, yeah. Ah, wh why the the question is why why doesn't this give you um, read resi Fibonacci's? Okay, right. So 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 um, um, right. So so. Um, um yeah so so these things are not really z3 parafermions Th these are different from the z3 parafermionic um quasi particles that you get on the edge of a read resi um they kind of they have the same algebra but you don't really get the sigma particle here um there's kind of a way to start from this and get to something which is similar to more similar to read resi okay so what what you can do uh, you sort of consider a um, in a, um, a one-dimensional array of these defects, okay? And then, then uh, if you couple them, this is like um, a, um, the, you can form essentially a Z3 POTS model. If you tune that to the critical point, you'll get a real Z3 parafermion CFT, okay? But it's a one-dimensional system. It's still not what you want, so you'll have to couple them in an array. Okay, like this, and uh, this allows you to, so you have a sort of quasi one-dimensional array of, of these one-dimensional systems and, and uh, um, you gap the bulk and there's a way to gap the bulk such that you basically push the edge states, you, you sort of push the CFT on each one of these systems to the edge. Uh, that gives you sort of uh, um, a essentially uh, Z3 parafermions and Fibonacci anions. Um, so, yeah, okay, I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer, but so, so I mean, um, at, the, at the end, what you can show is that if you just introduce these defects in an abelian phase and you consider their braiding, um, the phases that you get from the braiding are just related to the topological spins of the particles in the underlying phase you started from. Okay, you're not gonna get anything more than that. Thank <laughs> you.